Good evening, everyone. Um, Deepak, there's space here. If you want to come in, if if a couple of people want to come up front, we have we have some space here. Um, it's this is a particularly uh, exciting moment for for all of us here at CPR. Uh, it's uh, perhaps the first time that we've uh, tried to pull together the wide range of work that CPR does uh, across almost every conceivable issue that confronts contemporary India today. Um, I think if you were to just uh, throw a policy question into uh, the pool of this book, you're likely to perhaps not find an answer, but certainly find some debate, discussion, problematization, and critique of it in this book. Um, this, is, uh, th uh, this book is a volume uh, that has been put together by nearly 30 CPR scholars and researchers um, that attempts to pull together uh, all the long uh, uh, years of research that has gone into our work and distill from that some of the core public policy questions. And I try and identify some important solutions that policymakers, governments, citizens, and stakeholders need to be thinking about. The idea for this volume really came about in the context of uh, the elections um, and uh, the, the imminent prospect of a new government. We first talked about this sometime in late February, early March of this year when we felt that apart from the particular moment of the election rhetoric, there did seem to be an urgent sense that India was at a very critical policy juncture, uh, both in terms of its position in the world, as the world itself is going through its own transitions, and India is trying to find a place in it, how India engages and relates to the globe, how India engages and relates to its neighborhood, an issue that was particularly lively uh, and relevant in the months of February and March, and of course continues to be. How India deals with uh, the challenges of the environment, the challenges of the economy, which were front and center at some level in the debates and discussions around the elections. How India deals with the challenge of federalism, how India deals with the challenge of urbanization. Um, uh, new voters was something that kept coming up. Uh, urban voters was something that kept coming up in discussions and debates around the elections and what its impact was having what, what, and the impact it was having um, on, the, on our politics and inevitably uh, the larger questions about its impact on our policy. And we felt that while the elections were a moment where a lot of heated debate and discussion takes place, inevitably a new government was going to confront very, very critical challenges that, that would be placed in front of it. And these challenges weren't just about dipping your hat into the policy pool and finding five or six solutions. These challenges emerged from uh, a long process of structural transformation that the country has gone through, especially since 1991, uh, which are now posing a new set of tensions on the process of policy making. So it's not so much about trying to identify answers uh, to problems of today, much more trying to understand why the problems of today have come about in the first place. Uh, and understanding the problem is critical to figuring out what the right framework and what the right policy design should be. It's become quite commonplace in policy debates in India to scratch our heads and say, ah, well, the policy was, was right. There was something wrong with the implementation. It is time to try and ask ourselves why we design policies that simply are not implementable. And that requires us to dig far deeper into understanding the context in which uh, challenges emerge, uh, how these need to be understood, the pulls and pressures that these challenges face, and the kinds of solutions that, we, uh, uh, th that are needed. This volume pulls together uh, uh, the, the, these debates uh, and coheres around eight different subsections. We have a section on foreign policy and national security, a section on climate change, energy, and the environment, a section on, the, on economic policy and the welfare state, a section on urbanization, a section on regulation and resources, and a section on federalism. Each of these are independent challenges that the country faces in and of itself, 
but there are also very clear intersections. The question of India's economic growth and its economic future is deeply intertwined with how India positions itself in the changing global environment. The question of how India addresses its challenges of climate change, energy, and environment are very, very closely linked to how we, re how we uh, regulate our natural resources and how we deal with the transition of urbanization. The question of how India deals with the challenge of jobs has a lot to do with how we organize our cities, how we address the challenge of agriculture, how we address the challenge of declining female labor force participation, which itself is also linked to the challenge of how we organize our cities. Um, the overarching question of infrastructure has a lot to do with how we, in how we well, the kinds of steps we take on reforming subsidies and tariff policies, which directly links to the shape that our welfare architecture is going to take. And then, of course, there are the basic 19th century challenges that India hasn't yet resolved, the questions of health and education um, that would ensure that we have a demographic dividend that is truly a dividend rather than a demographic time bomb, all of which have significant implications uh, on the question of jobs, the economy, uh, the future of our, of our environment, uh, the nature of our cities, and eventually whether or not India can finally meet its global ambitions of emerging as a superpower that fundamentally shapes the world order. So everything in this, uh, in this volume, although distinct, intersects deeply with each other. And that's what makes this volume, I think, particularly unique. And what makes this exercise for CPR particularly unique. It was quite enlightening for many of us uh, to look at how uh, uh, closely our work speaks to each other. Like all good academics, we work very much in silos. Uh, and our problems are our own, occasionally meeting with others, but mostly focused on ourselves. But putting this together made us realize both the power of what we do as an institution and the Im immense contribution that uh, we can make to policy making by bringing a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary approach to this. And in fact, good policies are about multidisciplinary approaches and multi-sectoral uh, uh, approaches. So um, this has also been uh, an important uh, uh, contribution uh, for CPR for itself, as well as hopefully in trying to shape the nature of policy debates. This volume was, of course, prepared originally keeping in mind the new government, uh, but we also felt that it's important as a public policy institution to draw on our work to contribute to the public discourse on policy making as well and try and move the discourse away from the challenges of the short term into a much more uh, engaged understanding of the long term. And that's what today's discussion is all about. As much as governments are struggling with the challenge of policy uh, of India's uh, economic and, uh, and global challenges, uh, so, uh, so is the country at large. And if as a nation we are not in, engaged in an evidence-based, informed, uh, non-televised -televis uh, discussion and debate on some of these critical issues, then I think our role as a public policy research institution would be somewhat diminished. And so we hope uh, through the course of this evening to try and engage in a robust, informed dialogue uh, that doesn't seek to, to take positions, but really seeks to understand and engage with the issues that this report puts together. Since the issues are wide ranging, we've also tried to experiment a little bit with the format. Uh, what we are going to do through the course of the next two hours is to engage uh, CPR scholars in a conversation with experts who have taken the time to be here with us. We will start with a conversation between Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who's a visiting senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, and Sohasini Haider on our approach to, on the approaches to foreign policy that have been articulated in this report. Uh, we will then move on to a segment which is a conversation with Navroz Dubash and uh, Mr. Ajay Mathur uh, on the challenges of climate change, energy, and the environment, and then have a broader panel discussion uh, with uh, Devesh Kapoor, K.P. Krishnan, and Jyoti Malhotra on the future of the Indian state and the new pathways for the Indian economy, which will try and bring together some of the different threads uh, that we discuss um, uh, in the first half of this discussion. So uh, to begin with, can I invite Sandeep to just move on to our proceedings and thank you all of you for being here. A special thanks to the CPR faculty 
who indulged me in this idea um, and uh, followed all deadlines that were given so that right on time we were able to publish the report and no last minute additions whatsoever. Um, to our communications team who was extremely patient with CPR's very rigid understanding of what de uh, deadlines and discipline looks like. Uh, and to Sandeep who worked very closely with me uh, at, in, in putting the whole volume together and uh, had to deal with my disorganized uh, attitude uh, and my rather rigid attitude towards, de uh, towards deadlines as well. This report wouldn't have been put together without the communications team and without Sandeep's uh, contributions and of course all the wise words from our faculty who are far wiser than me for sure. Thank you. Sandeep, can you move us along? Uh, yeah, so let's get the uh, rest of the evening started. Uh, I just, one tiny thing that I want to add to that, that without uh, Ms. Ayer's vision and drive, this thing wouldn't have been put together, and it was a very, very large project. Uh, so for the first panel, uh, I would like to invite uh, Suhasni Heather, who is the uh, national editor of Hindu, and uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who is currently senior visiting fellow at CPR, and he has been former ambassador to uh, Syria, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. I hope I got that chronological order right. No. <laughs> Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the, the panel is going to be about Indian challenges on uh, foreign policy and national security. You can just tell us if you could back to the couple of seats here. There are a couple of seats here, if you want to take it, anybody from the back. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Yamini, for the introduction, and Sandeep for yours as well. So it's my privilege to actually get this uh, discussion on policy ch challenges uh, facing India for between 2019 and 2024 uh, started. Uh, I'm delighted to have Swasni Heather here as my interlocutor. And as perhaps a very recent, uh, sorry, is it not on? But, um, but as someone who's just very recently uh, joined the CPR as a senior visiting fellow, uh, it's my privilege really to, in a way, uh, introduce the foreign policy papers and the national security papers that are part of this document. Uh, actually, there are four foreign and security related policy papers and one on federalism, but they've all been combined together. Um, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to actually go through these uh, papers on the website, but there are two papers by Ambassador Shyam Saran, uh, one on foreign policy face challenges facing the new government and another by him also on a con towards a kind of comprehensive national security strategy. Uh, and of course, these two in typical Ambassador Sham Saran style are comprehensive. They leave no holes uh, at all. They are all tied up with dots and dashes. Uh, rather, it's sort of fairly mainstream, pointing out vulnerabilities and correctives where they are needed. And a counterpoint to that in many ways is Bharat Karnat's uh, paper on a disruptive uh, foreign and national security strategy for India. Uh, and the focus of that is really much more China-centric uh, as opposed to a very you know, comprehensive in that sense, and a very robust, I would say, a kind of um, uh, 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 you know, advocating a very robust strategy towards China, actually a very bold paper, which deserves a fair amount of uh, discussion. And actually, again, in, in total counter, counterpoint, part to that, counterpoint to that is the paper by Zoravar uh, uh, Dalit Singh, which advocates a policy of you know, peaceful cooperation, constructive cooperation, responsible cooperation uh, in the face of the Chinese challenge, particularly in the neighborhood. And then uh, uh, picking up a very common element in all these uh, papers is this uh, element of the neighborhood first policy. Uh, and, you know, something that is highlighted by Ambassador Shyam Saran as perhaps, you know, the first policy recommendation he makes in, in the context of the uncertainty, the geopolitical uncertainty that we have right now with a kind of, you know, uh, with, the, with a kind of erratic U.S. position and an assertive and rising China uh, in between. Um, and there we see that um, uh, Nimi Kurian introduces the element of federalism and particularly the role that the border states could, could play in a kind of cooperative relationship with our immediate neighborhood. So it's very much the first bridge in our uh, neighborhood first policy. Uh, neighborhood first policy. 
So, Swashni, I think with that sort of broad introduction to the papers that we have, uh, let me um, start off. I, th I think we could go individually through the papers, but perhaps some general themes that come across. I think the first theme is, a, is the, the sort of, you know, how large China looms uh, in, in the challenges that present us, and to a certain extent also Pakistan, but in many ways the two principal authors have, uh, you know, have advocated a kind of policy which involves a more friendly approach towards Pakistan, and in the case of Bharat Karnad, a more robust and aggressive, I would say, uh, posture towards China. So let me start off with this question on China. How do you feel uh, the CPR is addressing those questions at the moment? All right. Um, thank you very much, and thank you. I, I, I presume this is a more interactive version of a peer review that I've been asked uh, to come in and do. To begin with, it's really nice that so many younger people are here. W would it be okay if I asked you all to just, there's a lot of space if you want to sit down over here. If you don't mind sitting down, it's just I feel um, foreign policy is best heard uh, <laughs> sitting <laughs> down, <laughs> preferably with a drink in your hand, a television running somewhere in the side. So, um, you know, uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, you started by saying that actually uh, there were, you know, there is a common sense that China is going to become uh, one of the largest uh, uh, issues in the room. Uh, as India has to deal with it. I would posit, and, and, I, and I think the fact that each of the, of the scholars, um, Ambassador Saran, uh, Dr. Bharat Karnad, uh, Dr. Zarawar Dalat Singh, and even uh, Nimi Kurian, whose piece is much more about the neighborhood, but also brings in how China has okay. changed its, its attitude in the neighborhood, uh, have engaged in different ways with, uh, with how India must manage um, its challenges from China posit over there that actually it's not just China's, uh, the shift in China that we are confronting today. Uh, it's actually three shifts that eventually the net sum of which is this challenge from China. Um, the first shift is really the fact that the U.S. is now at the same time, uh, um, you know, pushing this whole, you know, we saw an accommodative Obama, if you like, uh, give way to uh, Mr. Trump, who wants to make America great again. So it's an internally assertive America who's actually on the retreat outside. In the first three years uh, of this administration, we've already seen the US uh, pull out of half a dozen treaties. Uh, we've seen the US uh, more or less tell its allies, forget its foes, but tell its allies you have to pull your weight a lot more. Uh, we've seen the US essentially walk away from multilateralism in the sense that the US no longer wants to uh, carry its load of multilateralism. Uh, so, you know, whether it's United Nations, whether it is uh, something like the TPP, whether it is um, uh, it's the GC JCPOA, the agreement with Iran, uh, essentially, you know, while there are threads of what the U.S. has done in the past, these are new. Uh, you're actually seeing the U.S. go into a very, very recessionary uh, phase. I was listening to uh, something uh, Ronald Reagan said years ago, just this morning, and it struck me that he was able to say it at that time. Maybe there is a connection between the way the U.S. is behaving internally and the way it behaves externally. So uh, he actually said is that the moment we stop welcoming new Americans in America, we will lose our leadership of the world. Um, so what we're seeing is a recession of the American dream, even for those of us watching from the outside. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, what we are seeing is China in a new assertive position. Everyone knows that in the early 1990s, China was all about rising quietly, uh, not giving face to anyone and, you know, retreating where it needed and certainly not putting itself out. Uh, we're seeing the opposite today. Uh, whether it is in our neighborhood, you remember in the early 90s when, um, uh, when the Nepali leadership approached China and said, you know, we have this blockade issue with, uh, with India, the response from Beijing was pretty much, it's your problem, you deal with it, because you're going to have to sort it out with India. You're a landlocked country, think about that. Today, what is China's um, uh, attitude? China's attitude is, uh, of course, we will help you. We will help you build alternative connectivity. So they have the eight-point uh, uh, you know, agreement that gives Nepal uh, access to land ports, uh, the train that goes from Shigatse and eventually will go into Kathmandu uh, trade. Um, uh, infrastructure being built inside Nepal. So uh, I'm giving that as an example to just show you 
very quickly, there is a difference in the way China is approaching your neighborhood, the way China is, uh, is also approaching uh, the rest of the world around it. The way it approaches its neighbors was one thing, but now China is taking a role in all kinds of issues. Uh, and it is more or less forcing for us uh, a kind of binary choice. Uh, maybe the US is forcing that choice a little more strongly because we hear a lot more from it, but what we're seeing is essentially the US has in its defense doctrine said that Russia and China pose the biggest threat. China and Russia are today closer than ever before. And they are now telling you on every issue, why is it that today when we open the newspaper, we see you know, uh, a, a question over whether we should buy the S-400 from Russia or not, because you are being given a choice, either this or this. You can no longer say, I'll take a bit from you, I'll take a bit from you, and I'll take a bit from you. What people used to call the a la carte option has gone away. Uh, instead, we are left with two buffets. You take the American buffet or you take this buffet. Um, why is Huawei an issue today? It's the same thing. And, and let me tell you, it's not just America who's going to be pushing on those choices. If you decide to walk away from something like Huawei, China will make it extremely clear as well. And, and I think we, we see that. Um, so I, I do think all of our scholars have um, uh, you know, looked at this situation from different prisms. And as you said, uh, Ambassador Saran, once he writes something, you no longer need to write anything else <laughs> on the issue because his is a comprehensive look. But um, you know, whether you see the two uh, alternative views of uh, Dr. Zaravar Singh, who's uh, essentially saying that we have to learn to engage with this China. We have to learn to build bilateral mechanisms that will actually build on India and China and, and sort of almost be a force multiplier for the two countries. And you have Dr. Bharat Karnad who says, actually, no, we have to cut China out um, of uh, being able to hurt us. And we do that by building alliances that essentially keep China out. So his, uh, his uh, uh, advice that BRIS and Mod Quad, as he calls it, which is essentially BRICS without China and the modified Quad, which will involve Japan, uh, India, uh, and in a lot of the, uh, the other island countries, um, is essentially at a counterpoint to each other. And then we have uh, the essential um, point about our neighborhood. And that is going to become the reason why we essentially have to confront the question. It is no longer possible to just sit down and say, well, you know, there is this 100-pound gorilla just to the north of us, but we can actually just do our bit without worrying about it. I, I think the, the fact is we are reaching a point where we are going to have to confront uh, uh, that gorilla. And, and how we do it will also decide how other countries see us and how Beijing views us, which is also important. Because as long as Beijing thinks of India as a country that is taking independent decisions, it will deal with us in a certain way. As long as Beijing thinks that India has essentially become part of a group or a bloc it will deal with us in a very different way. So I'll leave that there. Uh, it's certainly a very, very interesting set of four uh, uh, papers that really encompass the kind, of, um, uh, the kind of challenges that lie ahead for the next five years. And I think um, uh, what makes it even more interesting is the next five years is where India itself is, is juxtaposed and, and, and at a place where it could move, make major strides in terms of world leadership or it might actually decide to do a quiet rise of its own. Right. Thank you, Suhasini. I think in that introduction, you've covered a very uh, sort of large ground. May I just make a couple of comments and then pose what I think might be a little somewhat tricky question for you. Uh, one is, of course, you know, the phenomenon that you describe about the United States is actually not confined to the United States. In some way or the other, we have a kind of America first or my country first policy that is, in fact, the dominant kind of thinking in global affairs right now. Uh, it's true for Britain, it's true for China, uh, even though China tries to cover it a little bit in this kind of garb of poor prosperity. And it's certainly true for Russia as well. So in fact, in a very strange way, we find ourselves in a world in which we have, you know, it's a tricentric world, and a tricentric world in two senses. One is that there are three major, uh, you know, powers in, in a way that dictate particularly the security political relationships, and centric also in a way that it is self-centric. So what are the kind of foreign policy options uh, that throws up? You know, just a little while back, Zoravar had also brought out a book on non-alignment 
uh, in the times of Nehru and non-alignment in the times of Indira Gandhi and showed us very different varieties of non-alignment. And again, I think this is a point that is made by Bharat as well as by uh, Ambassador Shamsaran. He says, conf confronted with this kind of uncertainty and flux and change in the world, what are the kind of policy responses that are available to us? I, one response is, of course, as uh, you know, Ambassador Sham Saran says, <coughs> neighborhood first, strengthen your relationships. I think Nimi Koreans contributes to that. And in fact, he makes two particular suggestions there, I think, that are worth f highlighting, because in a way that also dovetails with something that Bharat Karnat says. One is he says that India is a, is a transit country by definition for the whole South Asia region. And we haven't yet leveraged our capacity as a transit com country that is capable of providing the role of transport <coughs> and transit in the region as a kind of political leverage with our own region. And the second is, of course, he says that, look, our delivery on our projects has been slow, and there's something wrong with the model and design that we have been following. And it's necessary now to, to create a kind of economic cooperation agency. And Bharat also, in his own way, talks about in, in, his, in his strategy for confronting China, he says we need to, in a way, denature and deconflict our relations with Pakistan in order to be able to focus much more and much better vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Oh, so sorry. I mean, okay. okay. Maybe this one is not on. Okay. Right. My apologies. I hope I don't have to repeat the whole thing again. <laughs> but um, it's the difference between soft diplomacy and loud journalism. That, yes. And this is not supposed to be televised, you know, discussion. Um, so, sorry. Where was I now? Um, so you were speaking about the challenges. The, yeah. Maybe. Right. So you know, Bharat also talks about. Uh, conf you know, about this kind of cooperation within South Asia being actually an instrument in order to be able to focus your interest in, uh, in, in China. Though, of course, he advocates, along with this kind of diplomatic approach that you mentioned, about which I have some doubts and I would like you to comment, can we really make BRICS into BRIS and can we really modify the Quad into a Quad minus US but with literal states of Southeast Asia? Uh, but he also, uh, you know, he has a much more aggressive military posture. And I think the military posture that he has offered is something that's worthy of a debate in itself. But, uh, you know, we need not go into that. I think the second point that Bharat makes, which is, again, very... Uh, he actually also uh, says one line at the end that says, we must restart nuclear testing. Right, exactly. In fact, <laughs> thermonuclear testing, because he says for 20 years we have been in a gray area. Um, so... Um, uh, so another point that um, uh, that came to my mind was, yeah, so Bharat again makes this strong point that, and I think it's something that is implicit in Sham Saran's also, that in a way we are going to be faced with these either-or pressures much more than we ever, and in fact that we have lost the strategic autonomy that we had, whether it was through non-alignment or through that period, ambiguous period, when we actually highlighted strategic autonomy. Do you think that is correct? Have we lost our strategic autonomy? Are we, in some ways, even as we talk big and talk strong, uh, have we, in fact, actually lost some of our, uh, you know, uh, of our autonomy in foreign policy action? And I think the great case study there is again something that is hinted by Ambassador Sham Saran, is Iran and Afghanistan. Where are we going on Chabahar? Are we sending conflicting signals? How is uh, Iran likely to respond? And if we, in a way, dilute our position on Chabahar. How does it impact on the changes that we are seeing in Afghanistan? Uh, in fact, if I might just um, uh, add a point here. Uh, in Afghanistan, what we have is a very active diplomacy by a number of countries, uh, but in fact, very little activity on our part. Now, there could be very good reasons for that, but uh, the sense now in the public and amongst a lot of journalists who talk to me is that somehow we are losing the plot, we are becoming irrelevant. Everybody else who thinks contrary to us uh, is uh, gaining ground uh, on Afghanistan. We are losing the political capital that we have collected and earned over the years. Uh, and if the one potential partner that we could have in a future scenario, Iran, is also in a, in a way being uh, distance or, uh, let's say, alienated from us. So that's a lot of questions, but uh, let's see. Well, thank you. And, and I, I do acknowledge at the very outset that you are in a better position to answer many of those, um, particularly the questions on Afghanistan and, and, and where we're headed there. But may I say that what marks our uh, policy today, as far as Afghanistan, as you pointed out, is concerned, 
is also what marks, according to me, the four papers before us that we are discussing. That we are kind of looking at a future, or looking at least at the next five years, without a lot of ambition in foreign policy. Essentially, what we are saying in each of our papers, and in, 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 in fact, in how we see the foreign policy of the next five years, is that we're in a holding position. That we are looking to manage the crises that swirl around us, even as we deal with our internal issues, because this is not the time to be ambitious. Um, you, you know, uh, the, the average comment when I say to somebody, we need to deal with the United States better in terms of communication. There must be a reason why these issues that really should not be a big deal, uh, you know, a motorbike that sells 300 items in India should not be an issue. You might have strong views about it, but really it should not be an issue between two big countries um, with such a history and so, uh, so many reasons to have better relations between them. And the answer to me is always, no matter what I point out about what the US is doing vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan in Afghanistan or any of the others, uh, the answer to me is always, well, you know, we're stuck with it for a few more years. The idea being that since the administration in the United States is likely to come back, um, let's just tread water for a little while. And if you ask me to actually say what I felt I missed out on our, um, on our policy papers, it is that bit of ambition. I understand that it is realism. This is our reality today. We cannot be too ambitious about keeping China out of our neighborhood because we know our reality, whether it's the Maldives or whether it's Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or any of the other countries. Um, and, and, and so when you ask me why uh, India has been left out of a lot of uh, the, the conversations about Afghanistan, because uh, even Afghanistan seems to be, have been left out of many of those conversations, uh, or certainly the government in Kabul, um, my answer would be a lack of ambition. You were actually at the helm when India planned things that were considered a madman's exercise. Uh, you know, the idea that India would build a highway that went through the south of Afghanistan, um, the Zaranj Delaram Highway, was considered complete madness. Uh, it, it, it came closest to countries that India really could not have controlled uh, uh, the situation with. And uh, it meant that India was showing its hand in Afghanistan in a way that would have angered uh, some of the neighbors, and particularly one of them. Uh, the fact that India said, we will build that uh, parliament. It may have been so many years overdue and, and delayed and overrun its costs and all the rest, but we built that beautiful parliament. We built the Salma Dam. We took on, frankly, one of our closest allies at the time, Iran, to, to build that dam and said, no, Afghanistan deserves it at this time. Where are those projects today? Those projects have been completed. What are we doing in Afghanistan today is what are called small development projects. That essentially means we're building schools, we're building little check dams, we're building uh, bridges and culverts. But we've lost the idea of that ambition. Uh, ambition doesn't have to be a strategic thing. It has to be what we envision for not just our people, but for the people uh, around us. A and I think when you say, what are the policy choices India needs to make? We also have to see that we have somewhere there hampered our policy choices by some of the other choices we made. You mentioned uh, doing away with a non-aligned movement. Uh, now, when I say non-aligned movement or NAM, the, the obvious reaction is normally one of derision. You know, you're one of those. You're talking about something that was part of the Cold War uh, that was actually a bit of a sham. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it, it didn't take India anywhere. It got India this little gang of uh, countries that who wants to be a part of anyway. Um, and I'm being simplistic over here, because over the last few years, we have seen those arguments grow and grow to the point that Prime Minister Narendra Modi became the first Indian Prime Minister not to attend a NAM summit. Uh, the only other one was in 1979 when they were in a transitionary uh, period. Um, and he did it as a policy choice. Uh, the fact that India did not go to Venezuela, most people may have said, well, you know, what's to be expected at this particular time, who would go? But symbolically, what we were saying is that we were casting aside an entire policy, not just uh, the membership of a movement that we are all agree is not exactly what it was envisioned to be. Uh, you mentioned Zaravar's book, and, uh, and I have to say that the thing that stands out both in the paper and in his book is that Non-alignment was not envisioned as a policy of shackling India, 
not envisioned as a policy that kind of kept India sort of below its potential and made India a scared country, a country too scared to form alliances with other countries. It actually was a tool of empowerment. It was a tool that allowed India the flexibility to say, on this, I will go with you, but on this, I'm sorry, I won't. And, and it's non-alignment that's to blame. You know, non-alignment is our traditional policy. Um, it became a way also of a country like India, which, let's face it, was amongst the, the, the poorer nations of this region, uh, of, of Asia, um, uh, to punch far, far above its weight and to have a voice. Why should Nehru have had a voice in, in the Cambodian crisis or, or any of the others? Uh, why should India today still be regarded across the Gulf, not just on one side of the Gulf divide or the other, but across Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya, uh, and all the rest, as a country with a great, you know, great past and, and one that evokes a lot of goodwill. It was because we decided to be part of a kind of vision, as I said, uh, of non-alignment. Now, I'm not trying to sell that to you. I know it's a policy that has been shelved, uh, certainly for now. But maybe I make the case to you that when we talk today about multi-alignment, when we talk today about issue-based alignment, when we talk about the 50-50-50 principle, I don't know if all of you are familiar with the 50-50-50 principle, but essentially uh, the idea that in a world where the US, Russia, and China are essentially fighting their own battles, where old uh, friends uh, who were powerful in the past, uh, like, our, uh, like the UK, are very, very busy with their own uh, uh, matters at present, uh, and other allies as well are you know, trying to find their feet, um, essentially the world will see 50 countries that are you know, active on the foreign policy sphere take, uh, join 50 different coalitions on 50 different issues. So on climate change, I will be part of one coalition of 50 people. Uh, when it comes to energy, I might be part of another. When it comes to nuclear energy, I might be part of a third. And the blocks will change, but there will be blocks. So that's, uh, so, the, the, so my, my uh, theory would be that even as we deride non-alignment and say it has been shelved, are we essentially walking back to the same idea when we say, um, you know, multi-alignment or, or, or issue-based alignment is what is uh, going to be our future. And finally, I, will, I would like to speak just a little bit about our position in our neighborhood. The truth is, this is one of the big policy decisions we have to make. Does India want world leadership without the ability to carry its, its own neighborhood with it? It is quite possible to do. Most people will tell you that, come on, China has uh, its greatest uh, uh, arguments with its neighbors. The US doesn't get on that well with Mexico. Um, uh, lots of countries, lots of world powers have problems with their neighbors and still go ahead. I would make the case that perhaps India is not amongst those. And essentially, without the ability to carry our neighbors with us, and our neighbors will include someday Pakistan, because it is a smaller neighbor, but it is our entire western flank. Uh, and to cut off entirely from Pakistan essentially means uh, to cut off an entire flank uh, of India. Uh, that that to, to aspire to a global position or even to Asian leadership will be that much more difficult if we don't carry the subcontinent with us. Okay. Um, thank you, Swashini. Just a couple of points. One is, of course, you know, Bharat does berate us for lacking it, uh, ambition. And uh, you have shown us that on occasions when we have backed boldness with conviction, we have actually been able to deliver. And I think maybe there's something missing in that element of conviction. Uh, you know, we are not exactly sure about what we want to do. And it's because we are not sure, we are not able to uh, sort of execute and, uh, you know, uh, um, roll out very strong policies. Uh, secondly, on the question of non-alignment, I think we should be very clear that uh, what we are talking about is, um, you know, the opposite of alignment is not the movement, is yes. generally an entire attitude, which is an array of options. And that if you talk about um, non-alignment, you are essentially talking about a policy that is not aligned to one or the other power. And I think that issue remains alive. And what solutions you find may have nothing to do with the name non-alignment, may have nothing to do with the movement called non-alignment, but can still be. You know, we have a few minutes left now because I think each of these sessions is supposed to be... Sorry, it keeps going off. It's not that I switch it off. <laughs> if it reacts to my looks, then I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyway, to back to the point, 
Uh, we have a few minutes left, and I wanted to come back to, I think, you know, this sort of really strong uh, contrast that has been made in the papers between Zoravar and uh, Bharat Karnad. Uh, you know, Zoravar uh, advocates a constructive, uh, basically cooperative policy, which also assumes that uh, China is going to play ball in exactly the same way, and a good faith of ours will be returned in good faith by China. And on the other hand, you have a, a, you know, as I said, a fairly aggressive, almost militarist policy being advocated by Bharat. And, um, and Sh Ambassador Shamsaran is, in fact, more a kind of centrist, uh, middle-of-the-road approach, which says, uh, you know, basically, we need to minimize the asymmetry in our relations. But he doesn't really, adv he doesn't really prescribe how we do it. Now, is it possible for us? Now, firstly, I would like to ask you, uh, how would you maneuver between these two very contrasting policy prescriptions on the one hand? And secondly, is it at all possible for us to address this asymmetry without a addressing actually one element which is completely missing, I think, from all the analysis, which is our economy, the strength of our economy. And the strength of our economy cannot be addressed solely by economic growth, because there are very big issues of inequality and you know, also political issues of division uh, that come into play. And in fact, Ambassador Shamsaran several times makes the point about the you know, democratic nature of the Constitution and the Constitution need, needing to be upheld, whether it's in security policy or foreign policy. Uh, so he, exactly. So when we talk about a comprehensive approach, uh, what kind of economic policy should we be having that would contribute to that kind of comprehensive national power that would be, enable us to at least address uh, the asymmetry, if not uh, uh, eliminate it, at least reduce that asymmetry and make us a credible power? In future, and and this asymmetry is is not just in the economic sphere. Of course, uh, it is also very much there in the strategic sphere, in the military sphere, uh, and <clears throat> and we can come to that. Uh, when you talk about the two opposing you know ways of dealing with China, uh, I think what they're essentially telling you is that China plays a very very large role and has a very large place uh, in the Indian mindset when it talks about uh, um, uh, foreign policy and when it talks about where it is in its region without actually being mentioned. The reason I say this is because countries, it is very well known, are defined mentally, when you talk psychologically, uh, much more by the wars they lose than by the wars they win. So China is defined much more in its mind by the war it lost to Japan than it is to its other adversaries whom it may have defeated. India. Is, is, is therefore much more um, in its mind thinking about the threat of China than it is, say, Pakistan, that we have um, uh, fought these three wars with. Pakistan, of course, completely defined by the, law, uh, by the war that it, it lost uh, to India. Um, and I can give you many examples in other parts of the world as well. But is this borne out by reality, or is this a psychological thing? Because uh, Chinese scholars, the ones that want to talk about the fact that uh, India and China must find a new way forward, uh, often refer to the 5,000 years of history. And say, if in all these years of history, I mean, 5,000 is an exaggeration, but we've had relations between Indian kings and Chinese kings, between Indian scholars and Chinese scholars, and travelers, and, all, and traders, of course, um, uh, 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 all the way to at least the 5th uh, BC. Essentially, if in all this time we only have one war between these two massive countries with armies and all the rest of that, should that one war define everything of how we you know, plan for them? Uh, if you remember, Dr. Manmohan Singh once said, I don't plan for uh, China's capacity, uh, I don't chi uh, plan for China's intentions, but for, for China's capacity. And therefore, I have to be much more worried about what China can do to me. But if we can put that aside as a country that is growing and that sees itself on the world stage as much, uh, and then deal with, uh, with the Chinese quest question, I think um, we will come up with policy prescriptions that lie somewhere between the two scholars, uh, if you like. Um, the fact is that, again, this is about the other choices India is making. When we talk about the Indo-Pacific, for example, India has neglected its maritime uh, uh, boundaries, very much so, strategically. India has failed to see itself if, if, you know, if the globe was upside down, 
it, it wouldn't make any difference uh, to us. But, but the fact is, if the globe was upside down, we'd be looking at these oceans and saying, my god, we have so much uh, over here in terms of resources and in terms of frontiers uh, that we haven't looked at. So if, if we were able to do that, um, uh, we would realize that we do need to spend much more time with our oceans. But can we do that at the cost of our Eurasian entity as well? Uh, when we talk about confronting one power in the Indo-Pacific uh, with this kind of artificial construct that all the oceans add up and, and India is somehow connected to the Pacific, um, when we talk about that, can we forget that we have a 3,000 kilometer boundary with that same power that can result in 3,000 pinpricks a day, if you like? The largest one was, was Doklam, but you know, is, is that something we want to spend our time on? Um, and, and the third thing I would say, uh, you asked me to speak about e economically uh, dealing with China, and honestly, it's not my subject. I will say, though, that in the last year, we have seen more strides being made when it comes to trade between the two countries, which I think has opened a door to how we can go forward without necessarily, you know, the knee-jerk reactions. China has opened itself for the first time to Indian rice and, and mangoes and, and, and other products it has uh, so far shunned. Uh, and I think there is a conversation that, is, uh, that it is a, a possible to develop. Uh, as China's problems with the US grow and as India's own issues on trade with the US possibly grow, maybe that there are more uh, that we can work on. But I think um, I would like to end this by, by saying that essentially the part of the India-China relationship that is least looked at is really the people-to-people -people one. And I say this because it is a myth that foreign policy really is decided in one place. Foreign policy around the world is actually decided by people. It is because of the great relations between Indians and Americans that India and America have now finally come around to this, this much better relationship. Uh, it is because Every Indian feels like when they go to the United Kingdom, it is like a second home for them. That there were these very, very uh, strong ties, even though m most would say there may not be much of a logic for it anymore. They were our colonial masters. They left. They left with a lot of, um, of our resources. Uh, but we've maintained it, and we've maintained our position in the Commonwealth, all of that despite it. It's because the people of our country feel a certain way. The people of our country feel the same way about our neighborhood. Uh, they've not been able to develop maybe in the same way, and, and Nimi makes that point when she talks about uh, using borders and leveraging them. Um, but essentially, they have not been used at all when it comes to India and China. And, and I would end by saying we need to start this, this next generation off thinking about how to understand China by actually reaching out, by actually studying in Chinese universities, or by allowing Chinese students to come to India, um, and by trying to you know, to, to trying to study rather than just work off the idea of our old traditional uh, views. I know we're running out of time. Uh, thank you, Swasini. I think we can end on that very interesting point uh, because. You know, we have uh, we are sort of coming to the end of this discussion. Uh, just one second. Actually, I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs> yeah. oh, because it's a full two hour thing uh, over the whole document. So may I just once again thank you, Swashni. I think you ended on a very interesting point. This discussion could have gone in various di uh, different directions. What makes it particularly interesting for me is that this is probably the first time that I have interviewed a journalist <laughs> instead of the other way. <laughs> I have the privilege of interviewing you many times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Heather and uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay for that very informative uh, panel discussion. Um, I would like now, uh, we would now move on to our next panel. I would like to invite Dr. Ajay Mathur, who is the Director General of Terry. He is also a member of several key bodies uh, on issues of climate change, like the National Clean Air Program and the PM Advisory Council on uh, Climate Change. Uh, in conversation with him uh, will be Professor Navroz. Uh, uh, in conversation with him, uh, in conversation with him would be Professor uh, Navroz Dubash, who is uh, 
uh, who is from CPR and uh, coordinates the initiative on climate change, energy, and environment. And uh, very predictably, the conversation is going to be about climate change. So. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Um, and uh, uh, that was a fascinating discussion we just had on, on foreign policy. Uh, and I'm very confident that we will also have a fascinating conversation uh, on climate change, energy, and environment. I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur, who combines in his person uh, not only sort of a, a leading academic, but also a, a very respected policy insider in, in governmental processes and uh, a diplomatic presence on energy and climate change uh, issues. So Ajay really spans the spectrum of the issues that we, uh, that we work on. Um, as Sandeep and Yamani mentioned, the collection of, of uh, papers before you includes a set of papers uh, on climate change, on air pollution, and on energy, and in particular, electricity. So in the next half an hour or so, uh, we want to have a bit of a conversation across all these uh, topics. So I will maybe briefly introduce uh, some of the content of the note, very, very briefly, and then maybe uh, seek Ajay's reaction. To try and keep it interesting, I'm going to be relatively pointed in my questions, and Ajay will no doubt take it where he thinks uh, uh, best, uh, but, uh, but I will try and sort of be a little provocative if I, if I can. So just starting uh, first with climate change, which is an area that CPR has long uh, worked in, uh, and uh, I would like to think reasonably well known for, not least because of the work of my colleague uh, Lavanya Rajamani, uh, but also some uh, uh, young scholars who've joined us, Aditya Pillay, Ankit Bharadwaj, and um, uh, Parth Bhatia. And in the note that we have on climate change, the argument we make really is that climate change has long been thought of as a diplomatic issue, uh, but because India is so deeply vulnerable, maybe the time has come, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, that is, maybe the time has come to really think about what it means for climate change to be engaged with as a domestic policy uh, issue. And so in that context, what, what can we do? I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to the note for the details, but we talk about some of the foreign policy changes that India could, could take on, uh, thinking about our relationship with China in a more creative way, uh, to hark back to the previous panel. But sticking to the domestic side of things for this conversation, the sorts of things we ask are, can we think about our domestic institutional structure in such a way that the obvious linkages between climate change and our coastlines, climate change and our cities, climate change and our agriculture, these things are exploited a little bit more. Can we work climate change into the thinking about our large welfare schemes, like, the, uh, 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 like Manrega, like the PDS, like crop insurance, all of which are deeply, uh, deeply salient? And so those are the kinds of issues we develop. How can we actually think about climate change in this more expansive way, which uh, we feel it deserves to be thought about uh, in? And so to bring Ajay into the conversation, uh, to be a little provocative, uh, Ajay, can I ask, you know, let's take India's farmers. The farmer crisis was an issue, perhaps didn't feature as much in the last election as people thought it would, but it was very much on the boil. Uh, and climate change is almost certainly likely to add to the woes of Indian farmers. Um, yet, when we talk about farmer politics in India, we don't think about climate change. We don't make that linkage. When we think about Manrega, PDS, uh, uh, crop insurance, uh, 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 agricultural support prices, we don't think about <coughs> climate change. Uh, is there a productive linkage there that we can make? Taking the example of farmers and agriculture as, as the entry point, but the broader point about mainstreaming climate change to some of our development debates. Would love to hear your reflections. Uh, thanks, Navros. It's an absolute delight to be here uh, at this discussion. Uh, without wasting any time on thanking everybody around, uh, let me get to the heart of what, uh, Navroz, you just said. One of the problems as far as the impacts of climate change is concerned, and certainly as far as farmers are concerned, is that climate change will exacerbate problems that already exist. Water distribution, land management are issues even today. What climate change will do is make them worse. So very often what we are talking about is fixing something which is already broken. You think that should be easy, but actually it's more difficult. Why hasn't it been fixed till yet? Let me take an example. <coughs> what do we do? about the floods and droughts that we have. Well, till some time ago, the finance minister would get up in parliament and say, I would like to 
provide this kind of support and like the parliament to approve uh, emergency uh, expenditure of X thousand crores. Then we got a little smart and created the National Disaster Management Authority. And there's, therefore, there is some amount of proactive work that is done, at least as far as preparedness for dealing with the impacts of disasters is concerned. But does that substantially change the way we work? I would suggest it doesn't. Think of how would we deal if we are looking at climate change and seeing that water availability becomes more and more volatile. Even today, the uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology says that even today, the Indian monsoon has not changed in terms of the amount of rain that it provides. But what has changed is that the number of rainy days has become a lot fewer. And therefore, by implication, the number of days between rains has also increased. Droughts and floods happening together. What would you do in such a case? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to think, well, we need storage. And we need local storage because the availability of water, whether it's groundwater or it's monsoon, is going to change from one area to another. Uh, do we do any local storage? When we do, it makes the papers. This village in Bundelkhand created local storage, and when a drought occurred, they did not need tankers to come in. Why shouldn't that happen everywhere? I would argue that more than anything else, what we need are systems that make this happen. I will only suggest two things. One, which I hope we move ahead now that we have an approved program called Kusum, is solar pumps in which the excess electricity is bought by the grid. This is great. For years, we have not been able to put a price on electricity for agriculture. Now what you're doing is the reverse. Now the farmer is saying, ah, if I'm going to pump more, I'm going to lose the money I'll get by selling electricity. So indirectly, you are providing the price signal that was needed. The second thing I'd like banks to do is to provide loans for pipes from one farm to the other, maybe pipes with holes so you can do micro-irrigation, and for instruments which measure water flow. So if I have a solar pump, or if I have a storage tank that I've built on my land, I can supply water to my neighbor. I'm creating a water market. Where water markets, local water markets exist, They've been extremely successful. As we do these two things, we create the infrastructure that is needed for local action to be able to occur. And Navroz, I'll end with one more suggestion. Most uh, impacts, particularly agricultural impacts, are very local. So the impacts you would have here would be very different from the impacts in Coimbatore. How does the government deal with what action is needed in the field through a person called the Block Development Officer, BDO. I would argue that the capacities of BDOs need to be massively upgraded so that they also take climate into account. If there is going to be a drought, I will be late in sowing my paddy crop. Aha! BDO says, let me get seeds for green manure crops. There's more days between the wheat and the paddy crops. We'll do a full cycle of green manure and crops. The short point is, I don't think there are easy solutions. They are not easy because they haven't been done for many years, but it's not as if they don't exist. Oh, great, thank you. It's a really, a really comprehensive answer. I, I just will want to note that the next session is on state capacity. Aha. It's very precious, I must say. Um, uh, I, I do want to move to the other topics, but I can't resist pushing back on one point, uh, if I might, Dr. Mathur. Uh, is it necessarily the case, I completely agree with you, that we already start with land and water problems. Mm -hmm. This is not new with climate change. But the question is, can the additional heft and threat of climate change not make it easier? And I'm curious to think why it should necessarily make it harder. Isn't it a question of how we use 
uh, uh, that uh, this this new way of looking at the problem in a sense. Okay, so this is again one of those things on which there's no straight answer. Yeah. Uh, the I would suggest that the Kusum program for solar pumps and the uh, purchase of electricity from this excess electricity solar pumps was driven by the need to bring in solar, which to some extent is also driven by our commitments to the Paris Agreement. So th there may be a linkage, albeit weak. But on the other hand, every day that passes when we don't find solutions, for example, to these kinds of agricultural problems, vested interests, mafias of various sorts, I mean, there are water mafias all around, become ever more strong. So fighting them becomes much more difficult. So the sooner we start it, the better it is. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. Maybe we can turn to, uh, to some of the discussions around electricity, something mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. we, we both sort of, I think, have mm -hmm. uh, you know, banged our heads against for, 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 for quite a while. Um, uh, I think one of the notable successes in the last few years is the Sobhagya scheme and its predecessor schemes in stringing wires out and getting the prospect of electricity, yeah. and in some cases actually electricity, out to uh, rural India. But thinking beyond poles and wires, which is the title mm -hmm. of our brief, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm drawing here now on our, on our team at CPR, which includes Ashwini Swen, Anna Agarwal, uh, Ira Sharma, Sharda Das, uh, and Parth Bhatia. Um, the, what we are trying to think about is, even though we've strung these wires out, mm -hmm. India is locked in a low-level equilibrium around electricity. Mm. We tend to cross-subsidize rural mm. access, mm. keep it cheap, but as a result, the distribution companies have an incentive not to provide electricity yeah. or provide bad yeah, electricity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it time, now that the wires are laid, to think about a model from electricity being about redistributive welfare to electricity being about enhancing productivity, so that farmers actually see a story where if their productivity can be enhanced, they're more likely to demand better quality, quality electricity, but also be willing to pay. What would it take to make that shift? And we sort of suggest, well, you know, yeah. there are perhaps things one can do. So focusing on subsidizing productive That's demand right. That's right. Uh, rather than consumption, uh, maybe shifting to fiscal subsidies so that the distribution companies can actually, uh, their finances improve and they can actually provide better service and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Is that, are we, are we ready for that shift in mindset and all the associated complexities and pushing get back against the entrenched politics of redistributive welfareism in the power sector? Um, if we look at India of about 15 years ago, the biggest challenge was, do I have enough electricity in the country to supply all the needs? And the answer was no. There weren't enough power plants. And therefore, the policy emphasis of 15 years ago to say about five or six years ago was let's make sure that we build as many power stations as possible. And we were successful. Today, India has something, I don't know, 350 gigawatts of installed capacity. And the maximum that we have ever sold is less than 180. So there's a huge amount of capacity. About five, six years ago, well, actually starting from 2007 onwards, there started a process of thinking, OK, how do we get this electricity to everybody? And therefore, the access question became very large. And particularly in the last five years, the emphasis on connecting every household became the public policy question. And a lot of money, public money, went into making sure that every house had a wire. I'm told that on the 31st of March this year, that process was more or less completed. Somewhere near 100% of Indian houses, those who want it, are connected to the grid. I think it's now time to move to the third public policy question, which is what you asked. How do we make sure that they get reliable electricity? The reason they don't get reliable electricity is not because there are no wires, because there are wires. It's not because there's no electricity, because there are power stations. In fact, they're going into default because they don't sell enough electricity. So what is the problem? The problem today, of course, is that the distribution companies lose money on every kilowatt hour of electricity they sell because the prices are too low, as you said, locking us into this uh, low-level equilibrium. Can we get out of it? The answer is yes. 
And it's a, a two-pronged answer based on things that are happening. The first thing that is happening is that a very large number of what are called as microgrids have been set up over the years to supply electricity in a distributed, decentralized manner, not connected to the grid. There was nothing there. I set up a solar panel and a set of solar panels and provided electricity if you, everybody wanted it. Yes, it was expensive. But now they've got the grid electricity. Our challenge is how do we make the grids, the microgrids, to be grid uh, interactive? And that's the word that is used. Because then what can happen is that I get electricity for as many hours as the grid supplies, and then I can buy electricity from the grid at no more cost than what I was paying earlier. So I get used to the concept of at least two tiers of electricity prices. All of us are. I mean, if you look at your phones, that has a battery which provides you electricity at something of the order of 200 rupees a kilowatt hour, 200 rupees a unit. If you asked me out of context, will you buy electricity at 200 rupees a unit? The answer would be forget it. But here I am. We have inverters at home. The electricity from inverters costed about 20 rupees a kilowatt hour. We did not use it to meet all our demands, but some of our demands. That's where the answer lies. The availability of microgrid-based electricity at a price which is higher than the grid electricity would allow households to figure out how much electricity they want to consume at, at what price. The second thing that is happening, and this is the fiscal subsidy, uh, we uh, um, at Terry are working on a pilot in Punjab which, uh, with the Punjab government and the World Bank on providing the subsidy that is provided on electricity directly to farmers through the direct beneficiary transfers into their banks. But the farmers have to agree to uh, meters being put. They are provided the same amount of money that they were, in a sense, they have to pay. So right now, when they start, everything is even. But now if they improve their efficiency of pumping, they will save money because they will get the same amount of money through this. Is it easy? Uh -uh. It's amazingly difficult. Uh, the project is, I think, about six or eight months old. But believe you me, convincing people is amazingly difficult. Will it be successful? I don't know. But suppose it is successful. Then it provides us with another method, the point that you said, about uh, fiscal subsidies and the electricity companies charging uh, full prices that uh, this can happen. And the last point is something that I had made earlier, which is, for example, solar pumps and the purchase of excess electricity. That provides the, uh, 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 the fiscal incentives that are needed to ensure that the farmer is interested in making sure that the grid works. You know, so now there's a farmer putting pressure on the grid to make sure that the fellow can take his electricity rather than he can take electricity from them. Uh, work in progress, but I am hopeful. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, part of I think part of what I take from your answer is also, uh, you know, it's the mix of economic incentives and inducing large-scale behavioral change through that through yeah. those incentives, which is which is always a, a very tricky uh, tricky thing to do. Uh, I, I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on uh, on air pollution and air quality, mm. an area that uh, we at CPR have mm -hmm. got into relatively recently, but in a in a very uh, uh, committed uh, way. Um, and uh, this work is led by Shibani Ghosh, by by Santosh uh, Harish, and by Mandakini Chandra at, at CPR. Um, and in the brief, we basically talk about we try and make sort of a very clear statement that. I, I don't think you would disagree with it, many of us would not, that air pollution in India is now a public health yeah. uh, emergency and deserves to be treated as such. And the reason is clear to us. It's now uh, air pollution, uh, air levels are unsafe across <coughs> the country, particularly in the indo gangetic plain, but beyond that, it's not just an urban problem. It's, a, it's, it's, it's also in rural areas. It's year around. We have multiple sources. It's a very complex and thorny uh, problem. 
we also have a proposed solution, the National uh, Clean Air Program. Uh, we, I think, are quite upfront in our brief that it's a, it's a useful start. It, well, it's a start, uh, but it certainly has uh, a lot of shortcomings. Um, and uh, there are several things that we could think about to complement and accelerate things in the uh, NCAP, including uh, some of the things that are in there, such as pursuing very quick wins. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Ujwala program to, to expand ga access to gas for cooking. Uh, but we think that we need to really be prioritizing actions, and that's a real failing of the NCAP. It's a bit of a laundry list, and that tends to be the approach uh, that is taken. We talk about moving beyond cities, which is what the NCAP focuses on, to an air-shared approach. Uh, after all, the biggest uh, challenge uh, is in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is far beyond, uh, sort of an urban scape. And finally, and this is the point I want to probe you on, we need to really focus on implementation capacity. We make a lot of sort of uh, uh, um, promises uh, in the NCAP uh, about delivery without thinking through what the implementation challenges might be. Uh, and we have a broader reputation in India. The story is often told about how we have lots of rules and regulations, but, but they're, 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 uh, we really fail to implement uh, them fully. So both in your capacity uh, as uh, DG Terry, but also uh, as a steering committee member of the, of the NCAP, how can India get smarter about enforcement in areas as diverse as industrial pollution, transport, crop burning, each of which with a different uh, a technical profile, but even more important, a different political and institutional profile. So the enforcement challenge uh, is really, and, and this is uh, uh, meant to be a segue also to the state capacity point, so feel free to, 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 to make that linkage as well. There was something that you and I have both learned uh, in the past, I don't know, four, five, six months, is that there are two, there are two uh, problems which make this particular, uh, which make this rather difficult. It may make it difficult, devil, devilishly difficult problem. One is that it is, you know, wherever a, uh, a, a um, uh, wherever non-compliance occurs, for example, whether it is. Uh, uh, somebody who's spewing out smoke or an open fire, whatever it is, how do you get to know about it? And the second is, anybody who's doing it is so well politically connected that by the time the pollution control inspector gets there, that fellow doesn't have the guts to issue a chalan. The only way out of it I believe is one, if the cognizance is taken by communities. Now, I'm a little apprehensive about this because it can very easily lead to vigilante justice, which is not what we want. And that's why I'm saying community rather than individuals. So if, for example, RWAs start looking out at it, at least in a large part of the urban areas, they would RWAs are given a number, are given a website where they can say this is where X kind of activity is happening, open burning is happening. When you go to North Delhi, you go to Mundka, the entire area today has a huge amount of tires being burned. Old tires that you and I took off our vehicles are probably being burned there. But I think what we'll have to move towards is a more IT-based solution. I don't know how many uh, 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 cell phone towers are there in Delhi. Can we mount cameras on them? We discussed this with one of the large, uh, air, uh, one of the large uh, 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 cell phone tower manufacturers, and they said, "Of course we can." He says, "You know, that's not, not a big cost. Uh, the back end is not difficult. You'll have to tell us what is the information that we need to recognize." So if we can recognize that information, no easy task, but can be done, and a chalan is automatically issued. Now, it's not in the hands of the inspector. It is issued. There's a photograph, and there's a chalan. I think that's the first part. It's one half, but it's the first part of making sure that we are serious about enforcing the rules about what constitutes air pollution. The second part, which is the other side, 
is figuring out how do we create business models to address the issue of wastes. Crop burning has been talked a lot. Even today, there are at least three business models that are being used. One is to convert the crop wastes into briquettes and supply them to power stations where they, you can mix them with coal. Unfortunately, till now, only NTPC is doing it. NTPC is too far away from the areas where this crop burning is occurring. If the Punjab and Haryana power stations started saying that we will take these briquettes and use them, I think that would be a good thing. Second is to use them as a fuel to power something like cold storages. Again, it brings income. My short point is things which monetize these wastes would be useful. I have a colleague who's working on construction and demolition debris to see how you can get useful stuff out of it. You get a very small amount of stuff. So he calls these micro factories. But the point is, if you can get that kind of steel, copper wires, etc., out of that uh, thing, then what is left can be used as uh, filling material, and the rest get a value on the market. It is worth somebody's while to do it. Uh, EVs is a third thing. And I think the uh, 1.5 lakh uh, incentive uh, for EVs that was recently introduced might help us, at least some of us in this room, to be nudged into buying an EV and therefore showing a preference as to the kind of EV we want so that the market can develop accordingly. Uh, we need solutions both on the compliance side, but we also need solutions on what we do with the waste. Great, thank you. Again, a very creative set of uh, uh, set of uh, options that you you placed uh, uh, before us. Uh, you know, what, one of our uh, aspirations at CPR in the coming uh, months and years is to try and take seriously each set of uh, 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 polluting sectors. Mm which has a very distinct set of solutions. So technology may be part of the story, but you also probably require complementary technical changes and also to address the entrenched politics around those sectors. And I tend to feel that if you don't work on all three of those parts of it, uh, just a technical solution wouldn't yeah. work. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't uh, disagree with that. So I, I know we're out of time here. We need to uh, move on. So let me just conclude by thanking Ajay, who's battled a sore throat. Um, you know, I'm afraid we really, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand it must be frustrating. I understand it must be frustrating. I'm in the hands of... Uh, Half-baked knowledge that you are mm. dishing out. I mean, we are into climate catastrophe, yeah. and we are late in the day. Right. And we are still talking about well, we're in 1960. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that you've had yeah. your point of view uh, stated now on this. So, thank you, thank you for your comment. I'll be happy to talk thank to you, you afterwards, and perhaps Ajay will as well. So, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Mathur and uh, Professor Dubash for that very thoughtful conversation. Uh, we now move on to the <coughs> final panel of the night, which is on the big India story, the uh, econ its economy and its public institutions. And uh, we have a much bigger panel for this. Uh, uh, so I would like to invite uh, first Professor Devish Kapoor, uh, who is currently the director of Asia program. and. Uh, so, uh, and Star Foundation Professor of uh, South Asian Studies at SIAS uh, Johns Hopkins. I would also I, uh, like to invite Dr. K.P. Krishnan after a long stint at the Finance Ministry. Uh, after a long stint at the Finance Ministry, he is now the Secretary of Minister of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we have uh, Jyoti Malhotra, the National Strategic uh, Affairs Editor at The Print. And uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Partho Mukhopadhyay, senior uh, f fellow at CPR, and uh, Yamini, uh, uh, president of CPR, to be in conversation with the panelists. Thank you.
Jyoti for agreeing to be on this panel. Uh, since we wanted to uh, discuss the big India story, we thought we'll also bring two CPR faculty to be in conversation with you rather than one. Uh, there is a wide range of issues uh, that we hope we want uh, to pick up uh, through the course uh, of this of this discussion, and I do apologize uh, about the question and answer sessions, but there is a uh, this is a wide ranging document. We wanted to try and cover as much of it as possible, uh, and and keeping in mind the paucity of time, we thought uh, part of why we are here is mostly to listen to our experts, uh, and so we learn from them and save our questions for the uh, for the bitter end. So apologies for that, but that was the nature of the format. Um, so I think. Um, you know, one perhaps the place to start uh, is is uh, you know the the paper that Michael Walton uh, uh, puts together for us, uh, where he reminds us that uh, while the, the 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 India story has been more or less positive for the better part of the last 25 years. And uh, you know we, we can even uh, every now and again claim that we are doing, a, uh, we're almost close to China or doing marginally, marginally there, regardless of all the confusion around our GDP numbers. There is also a moment of caution. Uh, and I think that in, uh, you know, over the last few months, this, this sense of caution has become uh, much more present uh, in our debates and discussions about where India is going. And Michael warns us, I think, of two things. One, that the story of India's growth has also uh, always had a darker side to it, uh, 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 the, the darker side of the embeddedness of state business relations, and an embeddedness that uh, runs the risk of um, of taking India down the path of oligarchic capitalism that has now become uh, quite uh, uh, the story of Latin America. There's all, the other side, which is one of uh, fragile public institutions and a, a growing inequality, uh, even as incomes are rising. And is the juncture that we are today, um, I think in some senses, it's a question that he poses and, then, uh, uh, and one that underlies a lot of the discussion in, in this book as well. Are we, at a are we now at a make or break jun juncture? Um, and do we need to think more innovatively, more creatively about how to unpack the state business story on the one hand, and the other address the larger question of our fragile public institutions and their ability uh, to address uh, the, the deep inequalities that now confront uh, the Indian society, Indian society. So I think my, the first thing I'd like all of you to comment on really is how you see um, the big India story, and, and and then we can talk about some of the more specific uh, policy prescriptions that uh, are reflected in this paper on where we need to go. Are we really uh, uh, running the risk of the middle income trap, as Michael says? Uh, does Latin America loom large? Um, and is this something that we should worry about? And what does it mean also for the big 1991 positive story uh, that we told about our economy and our society for the last 25 years? So, uh, KP, can I start with you, and then we'll, we'll go this way. Thanks, Yamini. I don't believe it's a make or break situation. I think a lot of these issues have been with us for a while. I'm reminded of what uh, Arun Mehra, uh, former member planning commission, once uh, said in one of his ET pieces. I think the tragedy with uh, Indian public policy is that we seem to know 99% of our problems. We also seem to know the solutions for 98.5% of these, but we just don't seem to do them. So all of what uh, Walton says in his paper uh, is, I think, uh, stuff that's been with us for a while. And uh, it's not something which happened yesterday been happening for a while. I mean, the NPA story is not a yesterday story. But I think the NPA story is not just a superficial uh, banks uh, going mad and lending money to all and sundry for reasons of corruption story. If you dig deep into it, 2004 to 2008, India perhaps had the largest ever credit boom in our post-independence history. But 
it is also embedded in our exchange rate policy so if you start digging deeper most of these are uh, not you know simple superficial problems i think they are much deeper problems so uh, summarize uh, sort of what i feel about this i think we chose a clear cut path in terms of uh, what we needed to do in 1991 which is largely that in a lot of sectors we needed more markets but clearly that does not necessarily mean in india that we don't need state we needed much smarter and better state in a lot of sectors so i think well regulated markets in a whole host of sectors better state in a whole host of sectors i think that agenda broadly remains the same i don't think it's been advanced very much in terms of serious implementation in the last 10 15 years uh, so i think we need to get back to the agenda of state not versus and markets and and do it in uh, the areas that we uh, sort of clearly identify where we need more state and where we need more markets thank you devesh if i could turn to you uh, as kp says uh, we need a smarter state we need a better state we need a state that actually implements uh, is it that we need a state that completes the project uh, or do we need to think about the state differently i mean in some ways this is like asking me would you like like to be a good person <laughs> yeah in principle but i have <laughs> you know so many vices One must not start clear with principles and then come uh, to reality <laughs> i mean i think if you step back you know building on kp's point that we may not necessarily be at the stage where it's a uh, very different moment but i do think we should step back and ask if the model post 91 globally is of running its course and of course most of all we see that uh, uh which was a core part of which was much greater global integration and clearly you see that on trade and you see now pressures around the world on much greater exercise of sovereignty on technology flows right so all the things and it is manifest in our growth story i mean one of the things that has impressed me over the last year in all the debates on what the next government should do etc and even what academics are studying about india almost everything is about welfare but actually we really don't know what to do about growth we have run out of fresh ideas on growth actually uh partly the problem has been deeply am amplified by the severe crisis in our financial markets not just the banks now nbfcs partly the type of 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 the legitimacy that capital enjoyed for a brief moment uh so, sort of circa 2000 to 2010 that is not no longer the case it's not just about the crony capitalism but if you ask something like jet or now with indigo i mean these are so called well run companies there wasn't there was some crony capitalism for sure but they are self destructing it's not that the state came in and you know did all sorts of machinations so business the state is what it does is weak but our capital and capitalists you know that old thing that capitalism must be saved from capitalists that is also a case and in some ways the state's strength or weaknesses reflect strengths or weaknesses in wider society you see lots of accounting scandals and that's probably well one reason is that the accountancy profession self governance is extremely weak and so willy nilly these problems then spill over to the state our healthcare is in crisis because the indian medical association is a terrible self regulator right self regulation of the professions is terrible in our country and that's really even though the state gave them statutory independence all of those things these are and of course there's a scandal problems happen then everyone says the government now must intervene well this government intervention we know already is overloaded with weak 
the capacity, but each time we ask it to do more and more, and then of course we complain it doesn't work, it's not doing well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in some ways, I think my own sense is that the weakness of our state is actually a reflection of wider weaknesses, whether in Indian capital, whether the weaknesses in Indian society. I mean, gender is one case where we have all these issues about inequality and violence, but that is really about Indian society and its weaknesses. And then we ask the state, which reflects that very society, to address the problem. And why would we be surprised if it doesn't do a very good job? You know, we are also at a very critical uh, political moment, at a new political moment. Uh, and I wanted you to reflect a little bit about how the narrative of our politics intersects with this narrative of our economy. And, you know, it's it, uh, one of the, you know, we, we've talked about the trope of the state not uh, being able to do its job, but what about the trope of uh, political will not being in place? And uh, now that we have a new government with a resounding mandate, uh, what is your interpretation? Are we at a place where some of the uh, the big reforms that need to be done can actually be completed? Are we at a place where the political context will allow for new ideas, new innovations to think about the growth story? We've certainly seen a politics that is pushed much ha much harder on welfare uh, and much slower on growth, contrary to what one would have. Uh, thought five years ago. So just some quick reflections before we move back into uh, some of the more policy-specific issues. Thank you, Yamini. First of all, uh, I do want to say that I'm a journalist, and therefore I, I think I should be asking the questions, but <laughs> so this is a different role. But um, having said that, I think, uh, I, I don't know if any of you know, but the International Court of Justice has just announced that Kulbhushan Jadav has the right uh, to consular access and that his death penalty has been suspended. So in this, in this uh, way, I think the Modi government certainly will be thrilled uh, and will um, look at this as, as, a, as a definite sort of a success. As to your other questions about whether the Modi government's political will or the BJP's political will and how that translates uh, into um, in, into the uh, sort of economic issues. I will say two or three things. The first is that in this second term of the Modi government, um, you know, the day after the budget, the Prime Minister went to Varanasi where he spoke to BJP workers and he said, and this is when he talked about the $5 trillion economy, and, he's, and he used this phrase and he said, it's about expanding the pie. It's not about uh, it's not about you know making it smaller, but it's about expanding the pie so that everybody has a right to or everybody can take a piece of it. Now that almost sounded like Manmohan Singh, something that Dr. Manmohan Singh would say, except that I think, and then you read the budget more carefully, and um, you, you know you see that that there is some opening up in the railways, you've been you're inviting private parties, especially in, in, in sort of passenger, some services, they don't say passenger services, but they talk about services, infrastructure. Um, but if you, if you look at the fine print, there isn't really any fundamental or radical reform that's taking place. So in that sense, I think the Sabka Saath uh, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas motto that the Prime Minister brings out uh, or stated in this, um, you know, when he comes back with this huge mandate, it, it's, it seems to be whittling away somewhat already. Because if you don't have a fundamental and radical reform in the economy, then how are you going to manage a state where uh, expectations and demands are growing? Um, you know, there is no privatization. The, the promise of privatization has evaporated, whether it's BSNL, MTNL, Air India is doing so badly. There's just one little figure that I want to cite. In the first five years of the Modi government, evidently about 17,000 crores was, uh, was, uh, was put into Air India, to inf infused into Air India. While I think in the previous Manmohan Singh's second tenure, 
uh, second five year, second term, it was about 15,000 crores. So in a sense, Mr. Modi isn't doing that much uh, differently. And I think his fundamental, so I think that's where the politics comes in, is that your, he's, you know, he wants to identify with the Aam Aadmi. And that, and that's where the, the BJP's sort of primary audience, which is the, the middle castes, the, the trading communities, that is not allowing him to, to make these fundamental changes. So while he, you know, while there are, um, and, and we can go into other things about how government is, is much smaller and, and uh, uh, you know, you need much, sort of much more capacity building. But fundamentally, the, the BJP, you know, if the prime minister doesn't have a larger s set of advisors which advises him to do uh, and to, to do these things, then I think we will be condemned, uh, in, in a sense, to a, uh, to a middle state, which, which has a lot of promise, but will not be able to achieve that. If you can just follow that up, and then perhaps have uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan and Devesh come in. A lot of this action eventually has to be done at the level of the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while uh, Mr. Modi can lay out a particular vision, uh, if you really want to sort of reflect upon what um, Krishna said about uh, knowing 95% of the answer but not doing it, um, the action eventually, and even the kinds of issues that Michael brings out in this paper and structures, and across a number of the issues in our uh, document, the place where the action has to happen is at the level of the state governments. Do you see, uh, it's after a long time that a single party has controlled until the, until the last December election when the thing moved, and now that thing might shift again from what we have seen, such a large swathe of the country. Uh, do you see any alignment between state governments and this quote-unquote broader national vision or lack of vision as you're putting it together? Can I just quickly add uh, one point for, for both, uh, for all three of you to reflect on. We have um, in, in, the, in this document three of four different papers that look at this challenge of federalism. And one, uh, of, uh, one common thread there is that, again, we are at an important institutional moment where sets of transitions have taken place. So we've we moved from the planning commission to the NIPIO. We have an interstate council that, see, that, that seems completely defunct. Uh, but as uh, the, the, the needs of the states are changing, uh, as the challenge of regional equality, inequality is becoming a little more uh, is increasingly becoming more visible, do we have the right kind of institutional mechanisms to be able to negotiate interstate re uh, relations and interstate cooperation? Or, or even mechanisms is, uh, you know, you just had uh, Ajay Mathur in the previous panel talk about this new ideas, and is doing it in Punjab, not, a, not necessarily in the BJP state. When you speak to chief ministers of state governments, do you feel they're engaging with these issues at all? Is this something that consider part of their bailiwick, their mandate? Uh, what what is it that you hear from the states in some sense? Okay, so um, the first thing is that if you just look at the map of India, and you know that most of it is saffron. So except for Punjab, Kerala, West Bengal, uh, Bihar is also a coalition government with the BGP, so that doesn't count. Now you would imagine. And then in the first Modi government, you know that at least 10% of the, the direct, uh, the centrally, the, the taxes were given to the states. So in a sense, the states should have had much more money to play around with. But what you see in reality is that these centrally sponsored <coughs> schemes, which should have been utilized by this, you know, where the money should have gone to the states, are act, have, haven't actually, that hasn't actually happened. So the so you know especially in say HRD or in health, the centralization of those programs has become much more, and so the opposite has happened in a sense, which is quite interesting. 
So now that makes me wonder, how does that happen? So if you have a BJP rule state and a BJP rule center, so surely they should be able to work much more closely together. But except I think that, that states, especially BJP ruled ones, are not willing to ask the tough questions to the to union ministries. And so, so in a sense, they, they do what they're told to do. So you're given, you know, 100 rupees or whatever it is, and you don't complain. So you're not really pushing um, the envelope. And, and so that, this lack of questioning or this, this sort of uh, debate that, that, you, that, you sh that should have been there, uh, it doesn't really exist. So, it's, it's, so I, that's what I would say. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's absolutely the case that many of our central challenges are issues that are constitutionally either state subjects or on the concurrent list, right? Energy, agriculture, water, to take you know, three examples. And so it's not a question of either center or states. I think there's no way that it, they can be addressed unless both work t t together. And I think the most stellar example where you didn't have a formal institutional mechanism and we did work together was the GST, which is a phenomenal exercise of the states and the center working together. You, you can argue a quibble about the outcome, but nonetheless it was. And the question is, under what circumstances can something similar be replicated? Does it need an institutional mechanism like the Interstate Council, you know, where they meet every six months, choose a particular area and try to work it out with expertise, perhaps from Niti Ayo? Does it need some other mechanism? Uh, I think no matter what, these issues will need both sitting down, whether the center, uh, uh, and to the extent that many states are ruled by the BJP, and if we believe that the PM is, does have strong control of the party, then the question is to ask, why can't the BJP states implement, right? There's something then we are not understanding about the relationship between the uh, party and the states. The, uh, I think there's one, to me, plausible hope. I think, uh, and I've been looking a lot at agriculture, right, where we've essentially destroyed our farmer with love, you know, basically, you know. We've squeezed him so hard that he's dying, in a sense, right? Every subsidy, we intervene in every market. You know, it's amazing the rich can go to markets and they can buy an apple, but the farmer, what he sells, when he sells, how he sells, who he sells, everything is controlled, right, in some shape or form. Uh, now, that has, of course, had massive negative impact. The credit subsidies on the banking sector, agri the fertilizer subsidy on the soil, and electricity subsidies on the electricity sector, on water. So those have actually had massive negative externalities, and clearly the farmer is still in distress. Now, I think that sort of thing of thinking that, look, if the real concern is the income of the farmer, then have an income policy. Don't have a subsidy. Now, I think the PM Kisan, if that is our way forward, that look, if you're worried about low incomes, then focus on incomes. Don't try and use other sectoral policies to augment incomes, which have deep negative externalities for the sector itself and outside the sector. So one plausible path forward, you know, at least there's the foundation has been laid, how much it expands, and whether it has positive effects will only depend if you have the income policy increase but cut down on the subsidies. I mean, there's always the fear you'll do not, in, in, rather than a substitute, it becomes a complement. Then you're on the worst because you have the fiscal costs and the negative externalities. I, I think if that happens and you cut down on subsidies, right, and over time, I mean, the MSP and procurement has been deeply, I think, per 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 pernicious. It has made the, what I call the tyranny of cereals has so dominated 
I mean, the FCI, how much we subsidize. So you can begin to cut back on those things so the farmer doesn't have to artificially grow crops but grows crops according to market prices, but is, has an assurance of an income through the income policy like a PM Kisan. I think that might create greater space for more creative policy options, both at the center and at the states. I agree with you, Parsar. Clearly, the states have a, a number of these subjects. There is a, both a constitutional as well as an implementational uh, sort of role that states have to play. But uh, I want to go to the point that you make uh, in your paper on India's welfare architecture. I think there are now serious new trade-offs that we need to negotiate. Clearly, technologies like DBT make it much more easy, effective, and efficient for us to bypass layers of government and transfer money directly to the sort of the ultimate beneficiary. And clearly, as you argue, this needs to be uh, weighed against this whole concept of, is the government here only to just dish out money? There is much more to governance than just giving X, Y amount of money. So I think that whole element of citizen participation, so I think there is a whole host of issues there we need to negotiate. But I also find another uh, difficulty with uh, you know, the original sort of constitutional design, which is that in a number of areas, now there are clearly national markets. Now, let me take an example uh, of a subject that I'm currently dealing with, skill development. And in a conversation uh, least expected uh, with CM Bengal, an unexpected conversation, uh, completely accidental. She started describing to me the skill development programs that are being run by Bengal. And Bengal runs uh, a lot of its own programs, state skill development schemes and ITIs that run quite well. And she said, uh, I'm very comfortable uh, with a lot of my uh, children, you know, kids who are getting trained going to Bangalore, going to Kerala. Uh, if there aren't enough opportunities here, I have no problem if they go and work in Bengal, uh, if they work in Bangalore, and send back five, 6,000 rupees per month to their families. So which led me to a question which I had formally raised with all of them. We've created a national regulator, mm -hmm. December 2018. Uh, converged regulator for skills called the National <coughs> Council for Vocational Education and Training. Yeah. Now, vocational education is a concurrent list subject. But if you don't have national certification, half of the workforce that works in the national capital region will not be able to get employment the moment the national skills qualification framework becomes legislation. A plumber recognized in Karnataka cannot then work in Delhi. Now, all plumbers that we know seem to come from Orissa. All carpenters that are working in our houses <coughs> seem to come from parts of Rajasthan. So the certification framework clearly needs to be national. But skill development very often is not even a regional, but a local merit code it perhaps is best delivered by a local body. So I think I agree with your formulation that it's a more complex space. And I think we need newer mechanisms to negotiate this because we can retain skill development delivery at a local, state, regional level, keep national certification for those who want it, but how do we do this in a, a framework is something which needs negotiation. And if you permit me one more minute, I want to give another example. One element of infrastructure financing and all of this bank-dominated financial system is the absence of a corporate bond market. Yeah. Now, it will come as a big surprise to you that one of the major problems of developing a corporate bond market 
is a stamp duty issue. Now, when India became, uh, when it dematerialized equity shares in 1996, uh, many of these kids will not know, pre-96, you had 70, 80, do you remember the escorts takeover by Swaraj Paul and 78 trucks <coughs> with share registration documents standing outside the factory and escort said, it will take me 18 days to physically carry out the changes in the share documents. You know, from that, in 96, India switched over to an electronic dematted form of equity shares where all of this can be done in one second. We can't do that in corporate bonds because stamp duty on corporate bonds is a list to subject. And from 96, we've been negotiating all for, I think, a sum of less than a thousand crores, an agreement on stamp duty on corporate bonds. And this is a reform which can transform the financing of corporates, infrastructure, can actually reduce all your bank, NBFC problems hugely, but we have not been able to negotiate this. Last year, we've made some progress. My expectation is, thanks to this, uh, you know, a large part of India being with one party, there may finally be agreement. But for something like 24 years, we are not able to negotiate stamp duty on a piece of paper because of which India's infrastructure financing comes to a halt. So with these kinds of national issues, I think we need to seriously revisit this center state location of issues and figure out mechanisms like what uh, Devesh mentioned, GST council, prior to that the VAT council yeah. was an excellent innovation. Yeah. And typically, uh, right from Mr. Yashwan Sinha's time, the VAT council would always be headed by a non-central government party finance minister and it actually brought about a political consensus. And we saw something similar in the case of GST. Mm. And I hear from uh, Mekla that there is likelihood of something similar yeah, for agriculture. agriculture. So I think we need to figure out these mechanisms. And, and I think we don't have all of these in place. But actually, this uh, your point uh, sort of reminds me uh, in a some uh, you know br brings a new lens to how um, I read uh, Namita's paper and Philip's paper on laws uh, uh, and regulating our natural resources and, and, and building property rights regimes. Where in some senses, I mean, Namita argues very forcefully that you have a whole range of conflicting laws, multiplicity of laws, and uh, her argument sort of comes from, correct me if I'm wrong, Namita, it's very difficult to paraphrase somebody else when they're sitting right there and they know that your interpretation might be totally wrong. But, but uh, you know, she, she sort of talks about the different kinds of pulls and pressures uh, that lend them themselves, both in terms of the way the state looks at its relationship with land, people's relationships and, and notions of their relationships with land, that create this multiplicity of conflicting laws. Um, the center has a particular vision. States have their own pulls and pressures. And right now, we don't even have some basic things. Like, we don't even have a basic database of state laws, which Namita and her, her team at LRI, at the Land Rights Initiative at CPR, have been trying to build. Similarly, Philippe's paper on law and wa water regulation also tells us a very similar story of a multiplicity of conflicting laws, of frameworks that have been built by the national government but are not really being implemented uh, or, or even uh, con uh, uh, realigning state laws in a manner that builds around these uh, frameworks. So how does one get, how does one exit from this log jam? If I can just add one fact. The thing is, one of the issues that a lot of the papers bring out, especially the ones that deal with the environment, and to some extent was came up in the last structures, but also on, on, on resources, is the state often finds it difficult to enforce its own laws. Uh, the compliance is, one so the one issue one is, uh, how do we then think of these laws? Are they aspirational or are they regulatory? 
And uh, for Devesh, how, what implications does that have on building regulatory institutions? <laughs> I thought Devesh answered it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you can repeat your answer. Look, um, this is a conversation I've had with Dr. Krishnan for a while. I mean, see, partly we pass these laws as a signaling device that the state is trying to do something. Uh, uh, we pretend to rule, you pretend to follow. Uh, How do the lawyers in the room feel about that? But I think, you know, I think Namita's uh, paper, which is a very nice one, you know, if you think about what could almost interpret it of laws like barnacles building on a ship's hull, over time, more and more laws are added. Many of them begin to contradict each other, at least at some margin. And there is no one there to sort of reconcile, essentially, these many laws. And actually, that's a question I want to ask Dr. Krishnan, because after all, many of these are drafted by the civil service. Uh, in some ways, there is a sense, and I could be wrong, that the quality of just drafting in the law ministry has deteriorated. And so you get legislation that comes out that is poorly drafted. And of course, then there'll be, there'll be litigation around some wording, phrasing, that contradicts some other law. And then you are stuck in the court system forever and ever sort of thing. And so one is, and this is just uh, taking from Namita's paper, is that you know we have institutional bodies like the Law Commission, which have actually worked pretty well, where the state can request it to work on something like this and give it the task of trying to reconcile. Uh, whether it is land, whether it is other issues where you have not only contradictory central and state legislation, but also within each of the states and the centers, their own laws, right? So in that sense, it's not easy. But there are mechanisms that make this possible. But you know, I mean, the, just the quality of drafting capabilities seems to have deteriorated. And I'm, I'm not sure why. So I want to ask this to, to Dr. Krishnan. A, is that true? And if so, why? On the last question, yes, my sense is the uh, quality of uh, drafting clearly has come down. I think it's also to uh, it's primarily to do with. Uh, the ability to recruit people in these very difficult uh, domains. I mean, it's the current Secretary Legislative Affairs, uh, Dr. Narayan Raju, has had two extensions. They are still struggling to find a replacement. And below him, there are a whole bunch of people, most of whom are on extension. So we, we just don't seem to have good legislative draftsmen or draftswoman. Uh, so, why uh, uh, is that the case? The A, I think the output in terms of legislations, uh, people in your setup would know this better. I don't have the data. I suspect we are writing hell of a lot more laws than we did in the past. Uh, I think the numbers must be very large. And two, very often these are written in, in a great hurry. So seldom is the writing, uh, the scrutiny uh, as good as it should be. Uh, and uh, you know, in one sense, uh, it's like the question that you asked at the very beginning, uh, which is a series of questions that, for instance, Namita asks in her uh, policy note. <coughs> Why are vacancies not filled up? you ask, why are administrative manuals not updated with changes in legislation and judicial precedent? Why do interdepartmental meetings for coordination not take place? In one sense, I mean, why doesn't government work? <laughs> because all of this goes back to, this is supposed to be bread and butter for us. We are here to write legislation. And if we don't write legislation well, we don't do interdepartmental meetings. We don't do administrative manuals. What do we do then? So I think it then goes back to this so question. <laughs> no, no. If, 
if, if, if we had, if we had the answer to this question, we would have cracked it. So it is not an easy question to answer. But in the first Modi government, if you remember, hmm. there were a lot of, the, especially the archaic law, the pre-independence. A lot of the laws, a lot of the laws were re sort of removed from the from the books. So that was a good move, wasn't it? No, no, it was certainly a good move, but same uh, time, uh, Namita perhaps remembers this, there was an attempt at reconciling tenancy legislations across India. And, and some of these tenancy laws are utterly crazy. It's like uh, killing agriculture with love. A whole bunch of people who are desperate to give out their farms on lease cannot do so because we have completely crazy tenancy restrictions. There was a Niti Ayo committee which did enormous amount of work and wrote out a model tenancy legislation very early, 2014 or 15. It just didn't move. So it died. It, it was circulated. Some states protested. Uh, it, it was broadly the same kind of responses that you get for most things that you circulate. Typically, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Gujarat, uh, Karnataka, another couple of states will respond uh, within the timeline that you've given. Tamil Nadu will oppose it. <laughs> Karnataka will be somewhere in the middle. Uh, Maharashtra, uh, depending on the nature of the issue, urban Mumbai land, Maharashtra has strong views. The rest of the uh, you know, rural lands, it doesn't typically have a view. Gujarat typically has a very practical view. And Gujarat will figure out if there is a good suggestion in the Government of India uh, draft legislation, and if it's a concurrent list subject, Gujarat will do a specific <laughs> amendment before the Government of India has even brought it. So that exactly that happened. But the draft tenancy legislation did not move. So it me, brings me back to the question that you asked. Uh, I thought you know, there was scope to actually do a lot more than merely delegislate, uh, you know, legislations that had uh, run out of currency. Yeah. If those served a purpose in terms of cleaning up the books, but operationally, it didn't really advance any agenda, uh, neither reforms nor just cleaning up state. Uh, so hopefully, some of that will come back, but why isn't anything called reform seriously progressing is a question to which you need to give us answers. Because you follow the polity. No, but can, uh, Sorry, can I just add yeah. one? I think, isn't the bottom line that this government is far more interested in projects and schemes? It's just not intellectually invested in policy. I mean, fundamentally, the Prime Minister loves X scheme, Y scheme, and he takes a genuine, serious interest in their implementation, which perhaps is unprecedented. No, don't uh, not address to me if I can just come in. I don't think it's entirely right. I think it's partly civil service failure. I think it's a question of what kind of agenda do you bubble up? For instance, this national certification issue, it's an issue which has been pending uh, with us for five, six years. In the one review that we had, when this question came up about collapsing multiple regulatory legislations, creating one agency, advancing the policy, a bulk of fellow departments of government were strongly opposed. It was the PMO which pushed it, and I got my single regulator. And I, I have multiple examples. So I think it's also a question of what kind of issues are getting pushed up, and are they being argued adequately? This is uh, my limited, I don't get to see all of the government, but the part that I have seen, this is my reading. One quick, uh, I think to quickly uh, push the wish a little bit on this. My own sense is, do we make the connection between the written word and the actual effect it has on people clearly enough? Because a project has 
clear consequences and has clear visibility. Uh, do we make the same kind of connections for these kinds of changes in tenancy legislation? As, for example, now, now that given that I've heard this, I'm beginning to wonder what's going to happen to the urban story of the Rental Housing Act, which is now part of this budget's commitment. <laughs> That's what I, uh, is a mo model rental act. The, and, and in that context, there's one other issue that I've thought of flag in this uh, context, is the way we characterize our country as urban or rural. And the fact that uh, our laws vary and our policies vary and our uh, implementation uh, varies as um, uh, Philippe, for example, points out, whether or not uh, a place is urban or whether a place is rural. How it's possible th that sort of um, cleavage or uh, classification uh, in part has been enshrined through the 73rd and 74th Amendment, but th the amendment is sufficiently uh, amendments are sufficiently flexible that allow again states the ability to uh, blend these areas. Uh, and, and indeed, I think uh, Tamil Nadu, I remember, uh, did try to do something of that sort. So, in your sense, looking at one of the issues that we're talking about, the local government, how important do you think this particular classification system is? And do you think it makes sense to try and revisit that particular story? Uh, or is it too emotive an issue uh, as uh, this is concerned? Is the fact that if you stop, or if, if you try to make rural look like urban, like which Kerala actually does to, to a large extent in terms of the functions it does together, uh, is that something that is uh, we should be talking about now, or is it too risky to start that conversation? No, I, I, I do think this is an area where India's intellectuals have contributed to this. We romanticize the rural so much that we need, we, you know, it's the things we want to protect most that we end up destroying most. And You're like the, the farmer. farmer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And so we create these artificial <laughs> distinctions. And we know, I mean, look, so many of India's farms are below one hectare. Unless you grow gold or something, you cannot make a decent living on a one hectare plot. It is just you can look, whatever you do, right, unless you just hand out cash. So we end up, but so we can say that, look, maybe the person can make a better living leasing out his land, right, for a factory. He becomes essentially a, a sort of rentier farmer and does something else. But we make it impossible for him. We pass all sorts of things that essentially that people could consolidate the land, the tiny land holdings, right? And so the small farmer, if he rents out, can actually make a far greater annual income relative to the pitiful amount with extremely hard work that he now makes. But we don't, because somehow the rural and the poor farmer has to be protected from all sorts of rapacious people that lurk around everywhere, even though we condemn him to a pitiful low income where he's completely dependent on the largesse of the state in various forms. So in some ways, it's, you know, unless we get out of that mindset, and it is a mindset, you know, this is not, this is across the country, that somehow things like leasing, tenancy, all of these go back to a mindset that was there 50 years ago. And we haven't really crossed that. Land markets, we know, barely work. And we make these distinctions between rural and urban. In your own work, you, you point out that Many places, these distinctions, just, you know, so-called census towns. I mean, what is that? Only we can create these entities. Nowhere else in the world, have you ever heard of census towns anywhere else in the world except us? So we don't, but there's a reality that's happening. We want to deny that, that reality by creating some completely artificial analytical categories. And then we struggle with its 
good consequences. Do you know the question that, my question is, with such a huge mandate that the Prime Minister brings, so, I mean, Mr. Krishnan, you talk to, you're talking about the bubbling up, is that the civil service is also partly sort of responsible for the lack of imagination, perhaps. Sure. But how about when you have such a huge political mandate? So one is the, the center state question. If, if your states are also BJP ruled, then surely there will be, you know, that people will be thinking similarly. Now, I'm not, I don't know about the civil services in the states and versus the center, but how would you, so if you have such a strong prime minister, I'm sure that there would be something that, you know, some people who would be, who would have answers to some of the questions that say Devesh has come up with. So why doesn't that happen? I mean, you have such a strong mandate. I could here to answer. No, I was just <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just passing on part of question. <laughs> I think actually it would be interesting to hear what you have to say about this and it sort of links to the larger question of state capacity that's the, the been the running thread since this morning actually on all of our minds but more specifically to this report been a running thread through this report uh, Ajay uh, in the session before talked about the BDO uh, becoming more sensitive to the challenge of climate change uh, and I saw the expressions of all my friends who've been talking about can the BDO just figure out how to do primary education <laughs> so are we, you know, it sort of, it does raise the question of, are we overburdening the state with a lot, of, with a whole set of expectations? Um, and, and especially in, in the context of the reality of the capability of the state, even to get some of the basic things done. Um, Prime Minister Modi himself says, you know, India is a 19th century administration dealing with 21st century problems. It does seem like there's a degree of uh, administrative reform on the agenda. But uh, is administrative reform uh, viable? And I, you know, it, I, I pose this question, picking up Devesh from the conversation we had today, and, and uh, you, you brought this up again, even in your remarks. Uh, the state as being a reflection of the society in which it is embedded, and India is also in the process of going through fairly fundamental social transformations. There are two very important chapters, uh, essays in, in in this volume that don't necessarily sit neatly. Uh, in 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 a uh, in in a uh, in a book on policy challenges, but it really was important for us to have them there because it it, re it poses important questions about social transitions that India is going through. One. Uh, uh, of these uh, title courts, tradition, and citizenship poses the question of the role of the state uh, in shaping uh, the, 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 in some ways, the social norms battle that is taking place between traditional values uh, um, and, and more modern ones, so to speak. Uh, another very important piece that talks about the changing narrative of social justice itself and uh, brings to a question the move for economically weaker section quotas that was introduced used uh, in, in, in January, it also highlights the degree to which old hierarchies and new uh, uh, social and class fissures are now placing pressures on the state uh, to behave in a certain way. So how does one reconcile all of this? Um, you know, uh, it, it's a big question, but I did want to bring this up because it was an important part of the narrative. One of the recommendations that shall be forward is, is the question of uh, are there safe spaces to have these conversations? Uh, because these are complicated conversations, and uh, you know, with which help people will have very heated disagreements and very strong points of view. Uh, are we? Who? Where? Among our various states, is it the state's job to create those spaces? Is it academia's job to create those spaces? Where are we going to have these kinds of difficult conversations? Where? We is it, um, is it our job to create these spaces? A, 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 in some I think sense. That's a really, really good question. That where are these conversations? You know, you have a finance ministry today which doesn't allow journalists to go into the finance ministry. So fundamentally, there, this government does not want uh, to have to listen to uh, voices that are contradictory. So I think that's a very that's a fundamental difference between this government and um, and another. And, and you see it in Parliament. Yesterday, uh, you had um, Derek O'Brien of the Trinamool Congress said 
that none of the bills have been scrutinized by any of the committees. It turns out that standing committees have not been formulated. So, you know, so where is the scrutiny? Where are these conversations? Can we set a good example right here? <laughs> no, sorry, but our panelists have to have uh, the last word, and it is getting Yeah, so do the parliamentarians. So they so have the same skills sorry, as you. Sorry, but we especially so invited them to speak, so can we give it? You know WhatsApp? It's the only safe space uh, <laughs> where where the gov where the state can't break in. It's of course it can. <laughs> depends, depends. Well, yours maybe, of course. Uh, but no, I mean I think it's a uh, it's 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 a it's a valid point. But I think I mean look, uh, one of the things I think we do tend to think that somehow our challenges are, we are unique, we are different. You know, all countries that in this stage of development grapple with these issues. We are grappling with it much more because we are a billion plus people. <laughs> so you have billion plus grapplings in a sense. Scale over here makes the challenges harder and we are much more heterogeneous societies than most countries. So when you mix scale with heterogeneity, it is going to be much more you know, difficult. Uh, and so in some ways, uh, I think it will be something which we will grapple our way through in the middling, muddling way that has been our core strength, I would say. You know, rather than the more extreme ones here and there. And so I think that is, by and large, how we are likely to work this out, and hopefully in a pretty decent way. Katie, uh, you have the last word, but I just wanted to uh, also I mean, you post you. Have the last, word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, word. last word on the panel. Uh, but but I, I, I did also want to post you in the context of, uh, of this conversation. Uh, what could, you know, what does an effort like this as a policy institution that is trying to engage? Uh, in, in a dialogue with government uh, uh, could do? How could one move the needle on uh, building, uh, on addressing the challenge of the state, on, uh, on addressing the challenge of a state that is transitioning in the context of deep social transformations? Uh, how does one address the challenge of the state in the context where, you know, perhaps there is some political will to make changes uh, and, and we still don't understand why they don't happen? So uh, what could be our role? We too are having an existential moment. There are a whole bunch of uh, issues that, for instance, the union government deals with, where we clearly don't have internal capacity. And uh, I think uh, many of us uh, do reach out, uh, not merely informally, uh, but very formally, we've had formal programs uh, I myself had, I know rural development, I know HRD, which have had formal programs of collaboration with a whole bunch of institutions, academic, you know, think tank. So I clearly do see value in uh, things like this. I, for instance, benefited enormously uh, with your uh, land-related initiatives. When I was in land resources, we may not have achieved uh, you know, a lot of what we wanted to do because they ran into problems that were unexpected. The, the uh, ordinance uh, never became, uh, uh, you know, the RFCTLARR, mm -hmm. which is the title of the new Land Acquisition Act. The changes that we had uh, wanted didn't happen for a variety of political reasons, but the collaboration was, I think, very, very useful. So my sense is, uh, increasingly, uh, the kind of complex issues that we deal with, uh, clearly efforts of this nature will be useful. But do they, uh, you know, do all government departments uh, necessarily take uh, advice slash material from uh, reports like this? No. And I think that's part of the state capacity problem. 
uh, when even when I know I don't have capacity, I'm loath to admit it. I'm loath to seeking out help. So I guess a part of the problem that we need to work on is to make the state realize that A, you don't have capacity, and there are islands outside, institutions outside which have the capacity, figure out ways to engage. And I think it will not be a very difficult issue because a whole bunch of these issues are not necessarily very political. Mm. Uh, a whole lot of them are technical issues yeah. where I don't see uh, a political pushback from anybody. So I think it's largely still a technical civil service call. I don't think it's a serious political call. And I think we should continue to work on it. It is, some of it is clear in the clutter. Well, thank you very much, Meenakshi. May I invite you just to offer a few closing remarks before we close the session. Dr. Meenakshi Gopinath, CPR's chairperson of the uh, speak right here. Uh, well, this is not just an important moment for the Modi government. It's an important moment for CPR. Uh, I think we this day reflects, in a sense, it's a condensed moment which reflects the everyday rhythm of CPR's engagement with ideas, issues, policies, and its continuous grappling. Uh, you will, um, you will, rec I mean, you will. Uh, recognize that there is a whole range of issues uh, that have been brought to the table uh, beyond the eight rubrics that uh, uh, Yamini uh, listed this evening. Uh, also reflecting the very important projects that are ongoing, the accountability initiative, the land rights initiative, the sci-fi, it's not science fiction, it's scaling, uh, scaling Indian cities, am I right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, good yes, very good with acronyms, the sanitation and water uh, projects, and so many more. And, and the real, um, I think the real value of, of this particular engagement today is really to bring up to awareness for the CPR community itself how much intense engagement exists. And she talked about us not being working in silos while we offer policy recommendations for intersectoral um, sort of uh, cooperation. I think it's a, it's a good time for us to start uh, at CPR too, because there are so many cross-cutting issues. And you're right, we've had a pretty laissez-faire, individualistic sort of approach to this. But this is a very good time for us to turn the searchlight inwards and sir, as you suggested, solicit opinions from opinion makers and practitioners such as yourself as we craft our ways forward. Um, the idea is also to continue interrogating received paradigms and to move away from the monocultures of the mind and, and also to recognize the incredible heterogeneity that we live with every day. But I, I believe it's also, in some senses, to look at the participatory publics. It's not merely prescriptions to governments out there, but to engage in a larger interrogation, dialogue, and provide this safe space that Partho was, was speaking about, to actually go out there. This is the first time we moved out of the comfort zone of our website and, and the many sort of thick publications that we come out with to kind of make our work accessible without being uh, simplistic uh, and, and nuanced without obfuscation. And that's a big challenge in itself. How do you bring to the larger uh, publics uh, such intense, amazing work? You know the, the quality of our scholars is extraordinary. I think it's uh, almost, it's not seen in any other think tank in India. And also the fact that CPR has managed to maintain this fairly uh, objective uh, quality and also to, be, uh, to, be, to have a gravitas while it carries on its everyday engagements. Um, there was a talk about self-regulation. Uh, Devish and uh, Lavanya and the environment group have talked about how uh, our development paradigms need to in inter integrate uh, environment issues more squarely. And I would make a plea that we need to begin really to look at integrating gender issues, uh, mainstreaming it 
in much of our policy <laughs> debates and dialogues. But congratulations to Yamini and the scholars and the experts that make possible a place like CPR. Today, there are indeed shrinking spaces for engagement, democratic dialogue and debate. And I think even as we are conscious of this, we, we need to open up more and more areas of interrogation. And I think that is the plan. That's the vision of the president and her team. And the fact that there are so many young scholars here, in a sense, it's expertise and promise that come, comes together uh, in CPR. It's the present and the future that's constantly engaging. And that's what makes this a unique, unique space. And engaging with possibilities. I, I guess it's what came out of this rich discussion today, uh, starting from, from the foreign policy uh, uh, panel, was in spite of the, uh, the, the coherence in some senses of the issues that are engaged with, the diversity of voices that exists in CPR. So you have Zoravar's position paper, and then you have Harat Karnad's, which you know represents, in a, in a sense, two ends of a very exciting spectrum. Um, I don't think Sham will be very happy to hear you uh, sort of describing ha him as middle of the road. Uh, uh, but we will leave that for another day. Uh, so uh, I, I guess this continuous engagement about trying to envision how many apples there will be in a seed rather than just counting the number of seeds in an apple. But thank you ever so much for, for keeping this vibrant community, thinking community, engaging community alive and more power to everyone's elbow. Thank you for being such a fabulous audience and for spending time and being here. It shows, I mean, just the fact that this room was overflowing shows the important valency and relevance of the kind of work CPR is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.